The killer whale, a symbol of the ocean's majesty, graceful and formidable. But behind this sleek exterior lies a frightening twist, a potential for sudden and startling aggression when poorly mistreated. Join us in seeking the truth behind some of the most formidable orcas and their horrific backstories that forced them into insanity. These are the hidden tales of marine giants, whose stories will leave you bewildered by the horrific actions of their captors. The tale of Kandu was far from the happy image sold to the public. Fans cheered for her spectacular tricks, not knowing the misery she faced behind the scenes. Her distress came to a head in a chilling incident that unfolded in front of a live audience. It was a tragedy where Kandu viciously attacked her fellow orca counterpart and suffered fatal injuries, opened the world's eyes to the dark side of animal performances in captivity, and eventually led to the eventual ban of such shows. This is the tale of Kandu, the beloved orca whose life was tragically cut short in a feat for human entertainment. Kandu was captured in the late 1970s in Iceland, a place well known for its rich marine life and breathtaking landscapes, standing as a prime location for orca sightings in its abundance of salmon. It all began during a time when there was a growing interest in orcas, so marine parks were increasingly seeking to acquire these amazing animals for public display. Kandu was captured on October 10, 1977, at approximately three years of age. Like many other orcas of her time, Kandu's capture involved a controversial and harrowing process. Orcas are highly intelligent and social creatures, and capturing them is no easy task. A team of experts first had to locate a suitable orca pod. Pods are tight-knit family groups, and separating a young orca from its pod was the first step. These pods were usually identified by air surveillance. Once the pod was located, boats were sent out to surround the orcas in a process known as a roundup. The boats gradually led the pod into a smaller area where the separation began. Orcas like Kandu are taken while still young, and the process of separating them from their mothers is very traumatic for the calf. After forcing the orcas into a small area, the boats placed nets in the targeted areas of the water. The nets were positioned in such a way that the young orcas would be separated from the rest of their pod. Once the young orca was separated, it was gently put into a net that was lowered into the water. This container was then lifted onto a boat, and the orca was transported to a new destination. The name Kandu carries a special significance, and it reflects the cultural importance of orcas in indigenous communities. It was chosen by her captors as a way of acknowledging the indigenous communities of the Salish region. For the Salish people and other indigenous groups in the area, orcas hold a prominent place in their culture and mythology. Before Kandu ended up at SeaWorld, she was bumped around to a few other marine parks. Kandu was initially transported to Marine World Africa, USA, located in Vallejo, California. At this park, she was trained and showcased as a performing orca. This was a popular marine park at the time before relocating to Vallejo, California. After spending some time at Marine World, Kandu was transferred to Six Flags over Georgia, where she continued to perform and entertain park visitors. She also had a brief stay at the Ontario Place Marina in Toronto, Canada. This wasn't only characteristic for Kandu. During this era, orcas were frequently moved between marine parks, performing at different locations across North America. These moves were a part of a business arrangement among the parks. Kandu's journey eventually led her to SeaWorld, one of the most well-known marine life entertainment parks in the world. She arrived at SeaWorld San Diego in California in the 70s, where she spent a significant part of her life as one of the park star attractions. At SeaWorld, Kandu became a beloved figure for many visitors. She was known for her remarkable performances and a strong bond she formed with her trainers. Kandu was a young and energetic orca, which made her an ideal candidate for the park shows and entertainment. From the moment she arrived, her energy made her a beloved figure at the park. This orca was known for forming close relationships with her trainers. The bonds young orcas form with trainers are essential for their training and safety during performances. These trainers spent countless hours with them, bonding and teaching various tricks and commands. These close interactions helped to create trust and mutual understanding between orcas and their human companions. Kandu adapted easily and liked her trainers, so learning tricks and performing was a piece of cake. 
She was a star that wowed audiences with her agility, speed, and intelligence. Her performances often consisted of impressive jumps, flips, and synchronized movements with other orcas. In addition to her entertainment, Kandu also played a role in educating the public about orcas and marine life. Her shows were designed to teach people about the beauty and complexity of these creatures and help raise awareness about the importance of ocean conservation and the need to protect marine ecosystems. Kandu's life at SeaWorld was marked by several significant events, one of which was the birth of her first calf. This event brought both joy and challenges to her life in captivity. In 1986, Kandu gave birth to her first calf after she became pregnant with a male named Winston. Sadly, the calf was stillborn on January 31, 1986. The loss of her first calf was a heart-wrenching experience for Kandu and the SeaWorld staff who had been eagerly anticipating his arrival. But she continued to work and was introduced a year later to a male and female orca, Orky 2 and Corky 2, who were moved to San Diego. She soon became pregnant for the second time and her daughter was named Orchid, after her father who had passed away just after her birth. Ultimately, it was just Kandu, Orchid, and Corky left at the park. And this is when the problems began. Kandu started behaving dominantly the moment she met Corky and started having even more problems after Corky became close to Orchid. She even snapped at the trainers multiple times during training and performances, but was still put out as an attraction. This is not a typical behavior for orcas, as they all become close in the pods, but Kandu didn't know that, and she was very protective of her daughter. But still, they were kept together in the same tank. On August 21, 1989, a tragic incident unfolded at SeaWorld San Diego leaving a lasting impact on both the park and those who witnessed the events, and many people did witness it. On that day, Kandu was participating in a Shamu show, one of SeaWorld's signature killer whale performances. She was performing alongside Corky. The audience was watching as they showed their abilities in the water. During the performance, Kandu was in one of the side pools, while Corky was the main attraction in the central show pool. Kandu was already outraged before that and very protective of her baby. As the show progressed, Kandu became increasingly agitated, especially when Corky approached Orchid. In response, Kandu tried to assert her dominance over Corky through a behavior known as racking. Racking is a common practice among captive orcas and is a way of showing dominance by forcefully scratching at one another with their teeth. But Corky was a larger and older orca. Kandu weighed 4,600 pounds at that point, while Corky was around 7,000 pounds. Kandu lunged and tragically missed her target and hit a wall, resulting in a catastrophic injury. The impact fractured Kandu's upper jaw and severed an artery. This led to massive bleeding, including the spouting of blood from Kandu's blowhole. SeaWorld staff quickly realized the severity of the situation and asked the spectators to leave the stadium. Kandu was immediately moved to a back pool, where she was accompanied by Orchid. Despite the quick response from SeaWorld staff, Kandu's injuries were too severe to save her. They led to a massive hemorrhage, and Kandu's life was slipping away. Throughout the process, she remained by Orchid's side, unwilling to leave even in her final moment. Approximately 45 minutes after the incident, Kandu succumbed to her injuries and the loss of blood. Her passing marked a dark day in SeaWorld's history and became one of the most highly publicized incidents involving a captive killer whale. It was later revealed that this wasn't an isolated incident. Since Orchid was born, Kandu had several aggressive outbursts. These included snapping at a trainer's neck and attempting to drown another one during shows. On March 4, 1987, Kandu was filmed slamming into a trainer. She repeatedly dragged him to the bottom of the pool. For years, marine parks have argued that they provide a valuable platform for education and conservation as a form of hiding ethical issues. SeaWorld didn't ban orca performances until 2010 despite public pressure. It took 23 years and multiple accidents to finally make a change in their approach towards these animals. They have since maintained that their orcas receive world-class care because of a team of hundreds of veterinarians and care specialists. But keeping orcas in the small enclosure in marine parks compared to the ocean is not the same. However big the pool may be, they are limited. Orcas roam over 100 miles each day in the wild. Was Kandu's death due to human error? Would the tragedy be avoided if the two adults were kept in separate enclosures? Maybe another case of an orca's tragic death could give these answers. Boy. 
It's common knowledge that Hollywood is full of fake stories, overactive imaginations, and made-up fictional personas. But what happens when you discover that there's something much more sinister looking below the surface? An outright deception that caused a tragic end to the star. And that star wasn't a famous actor, but rather an animal. This was Namu, an orca whose tragic real-life story sharply contrasts with the uplifting tale of Namu, my best friend. His life became a movie, celebrated and adored by many for decades. Yet just two weeks before the film premiered, Namu died due to horrendous living conditions, leaving a stark contrast to the gentle, playful creature on screen. His death was a brutal reminder of the impact of human decisions on killer whales. However, Namu's story doesn't end in tragedy, but rather it became a wake-up call, saving many of his kind from similar fates and transformed the world's perception of orcas. Namu was an adult male orca who lived a remarkable life, leaving a lasting impact on the way people viewed his kind. His story began in the waters of the Pacific Northwest in 1965, where he was born as a member of the C-1 pod of the Northern Resident Community, a well-known Northern Resident orca pod in British Columbia. A few months after his birth, Namu's life took an unexpected turn. He was discovered entangled in a 22-foot salmon net near Namu, British Columbia, by a fisherman named William Let Cobit. This accidental encounter led to a life-altering change. Namu de Yorka was subsequently sold to Ted Griffin, the owner of the Seattle Marine Aquarium, for $8,000. Griffin saw potential in this magnificent creature and decided to bring him to Seattle, a journey that took Namu 450 miles south of where he was. Ted Griffin's first encounter with Namu was astonishing. As Griffin approached the sea pen assembled for Namu's transport to Seattle, he saw the massive orca looming just four feet away. It was a moment that would define their bond. Namu made his presence known with a loud squeak, and Griffin responded with an And in less than a second, Namu echoed back with a squeak of his own. The connection was immediate. It was a costly endeavor, but Namu's presence would soon prove to be worth it to Ted. When Namu finally arrived in Seattle on July 28, 1965, Griffin was greeted as a hero and even received a key to the city. In captivity, Namu's daily diet consisted of 400 pounds of salmon each day. He quickly became a star attraction at the Seattle Marine Aquarium, drawing crowds of fascinated people eager to witness this remarkable creature up close. The word of Namu's arrival spread like wildfire. People wanting to see him caused traffic jams for miles near Deception Pass Bridge. Namu was basically the first orca to perform in public. As time passed, Griffin saw that Namu needed a friend, so he brought a female orca named Shamu to be his companion. Shamu would later gain her own fame at SeaWorld in San Diego. Namu and Shamu's relationship in captivity brought even more attention to these incredible animals. In the weeks that followed, Namu became a sensation in Seattle. Thousands paid to catch a glimpse of the killer whale at Griffin's Seattle Marine Aquarium at Pier 56. The city was in the midst of Namu fever, and the craze didn't stop there. Around the world, people were captivated by the idea of killer whales as performing attractions, which led to a surge in the capture of killer whales from Puget Sound, the primary source of supply for orcas. Over a decade, from the mid-1960s to 1976, approximately 270 orcas were captured with Puget Sound serving as a central hunting ground. Namu's extraordinary life didn't just capture the attention of only those who visited the Seattle Marine Aquarium. It also attracted Hollywood. In a turn of events that seemed almost like a script from a movie itself, Namu became the star of a Hollywood production that left a lasting impact on the way people perceived killer whales. It all began when Ted Griffin recognized the potential for Namu to be more than just an aquarium exhibit. Namu's presence and the ability to perform with humans in the water made him a unique and charismatic figure. Soon, he caught the eye of Hollywood producers. In the mid-1960s, the film industry was eager for new stories and fresh perspectives. Namu's life was seen as a unique opportunity to change the public's perception of killer whales. Until then, these animals had often been betrayed as vicious killers, similar to mindless and ruthless predators like sharks. However, Namu the killer whale aimed to change that narrative. 
The film was released in 1966 and offered a heartwarming and idolized story of a man in a heroic killer whale. While the film may have had its share of sentimentality, it played a significant role in shifting public perceptions of killer whales. The film starred Robert Lansing as Hank, a marine biologist determined to protect Namu from a group of small town fishermen who feared the orca was ruining their salmon stocks and posed a threat to their community. Lansing's character attempted to fight the fear of orcas with scientific knowledge, highlighting that their relative brain size was larger than that of humans. It's a story about a marine biologist named Hank Donner. Hank was out camping in the Pacific Northwest, studying the underwater creatures that called those waters home. One day, as Hank and his local assistant were watching a group of gray whales swim by, something terrible happened. They saw two fishermen shooting at a bunch of orcas. One of them got injured and ended up on the shore, where she sadly passed away. Her mate, on the other hand, stuck around, mourning her loss. Hank wouldn't stand for the hunting of the second orca, and he managed to set up a net barrier to keep the cove safe. This male killer whale became the star, and they named him Namu after a song in the movie. The locals, except for one lady named Kate and her daughter, didn't trust Hank. As Hank watched over Namu, he started to play with him. As time went on, some of the local kids came to the cove, and they started feeding Namu. One day, a boy stuck a sharp hook into a piece of fish and gave it to Namu, which made him go wild. The whole town got wind of what happened, and they decided it was time to take matters into their own hands. They marched down to the cove, armed and ready to kill Namu. It looked pretty grim for our killer whale friend, but Hank figured out what was causing Namu's suffering. To prove that the orca was peaceful, Hank put on some swimming gear and jumped into the water with him. This sight started to change the minds of the angry townsfolk. After all this excitement, Namu was ready for a change. He met another group of killer whales, and they all swam away into the open sea. The film explained that the understanding and connecting with these creatures was possible and that they were not the monsters some had believed them to be. The name Namu would later be used as a show name for various orcas and sea world performances. Despite its impact, the film faced challenges, including the untimely death of Namu just two weeks before its premiere. This event undoubtedly dampened the initial excitement surrounding the premiere. Tragically, Namu's time in captivity was relatively short-lived. After the filming of Namu, the killer whale concluded, Namu was returned to his small pen on Seattle's Pier 56. Unfortunately, this move proved detrimental to his health and on July 9, 1966, he passed away. Griffin, despite mixed feelings, said that Namu had succeeded in a supposed break for freedom, which ultimately led to his death. However, an autopsy revealed that Namu had been suffering from an acute bacterial infection, skin rashes, breathing problems, and a stomach infection likely contracted from sewage runoff in Elliott Bay, where Griffin had relocated him. Despite Namu's untimely death, the impact he had on people was undeniable. Thousands of local fans mourned his passing, and the aquariums around the world were inspired to obtain their own captive orcas. Namu, the killer whale, was later renamed Namu, my best friend, and found a second life on television. It was played often for approximately 40 years. For centuries, the native people of the Pacific Northwest revered orcas, seeing them as family members and respected creatures of the sea. However, the newcomers, especially salmon fishermen who viewed orcas as competitors, these creatures were considered vermin and dangerous killers. This led to a disturbing chapter where orcas were hunted, mutilated, and even used for target practice by the U.S. Navy in Icelandic waters. Ted Griffin's decision to capture Namu alive marked a turning point in the understanding of killer whales. He saw Namu not as a threat, but as a companion and a friend. Namu's capture and subsequent interactions with Ted Griffin proved a unique opportunity to study and learn about these mysterious creatures. Griffin's encounters with Namu, which included touching and even riding the orca, were groundbreaking and captured the world's attention. But Ted blamed himself for Namu's death and continued to work on helping orcas. In August 1970, he encountered a superpod of 90 to 100 orcas, possibly the entire southern resident population, captured behind nets. Realizing that he had more whales than he could safely handle, Griffin ordered most of them to be released, causing tensions with his partners and the fishermen involved. The Penn Cove capture marked a turning point. It led to public outcry, legal intervention, and eventually the end of orca captures in the United States. Was the price Namu paid worth it for saving his kind? 
Did Ted Griffin repay what he owed Namu? He supposedly loved him, but the animal died due to human error and agreed for entertainment. Everyone remembers that intense emotional scene when Willie the Orca made his final jump to freedom in the 1993 movie Free Willy. However, the applause and excitement soon turned to horror when fans worldwide discovered how the real Willie, aka Keiko the killer whale, was living in captivity. Keiko lived in a tank so shallow, his tail almost reached the bottom. Keiko's plight touched the hearts of millions who soon unleashed an outcry, bombarding his captors for release. Keiko's story is endearing. Although it may have ended with his freedom, Keiko would never enjoy it as a free killer whale should have. This is the tragic story of Keiko, the super order that we all know is Willy. Keiko was captured when he was just a toddler. He was born in the wild off the coast of Iceland around September 24, 1976. Unfortunately, in 1979, he ended up in a theme park in Iceland when he was only three years old. A whaler named Joe Gunnison, the leader of the whaling company, attacked Keiko's entire family. The so-called theme park he was kept in, which is a tiny aquarium near a small town in Iceland with a population of just over a thousand people. At that time, he was given the name Seki and was later known as Keiko. His journey into captivity had begun and for years, Keiko performed in shows, doing tricks and entertaining audiences. But he was far from home and many people began to question whether keeping a creature in captivity was the right thing to do. Later in 1982, Keiko was sold and moved to Marineland in Ontario, Canada. It was here that he started performing for larger audiences, but it was also where signs of his poor health began to emerge. He developed skin lesions, likely due to the stress of captivity, and had a tough time fitting in with the older female orcas in the facility. This was due to not being part of their pod from the beginning, he was very scared and kept to himself, causing constant attacks by the other orcas. Marineland couldn't fix the situation, so in 1985 he was sold to Reno Aventura in Mexico City, Mexico. It was at this point that he received the name Keiko, the lucky one. At the time he was only 10 feet long, he was housed in a tank intended for bottlenose dolphins, but he wasn't a baby anymore and just kept growing. His living conditions were far from ideal. He grew to 21 feet in length and the tank barely held him. It was only 65 feet wide and 22 feet deep. And Keiko could barely move, let alone swim around. And to make matters worse, he was sharing the tank with some dolphins, but at least he had company. The bigger problem than the size of the tank and his friends was the chlorine in the tank and the fact that it was always 80 degrees. Much warmer water than orcas should live in and large amounts of chlorine meant they were saving money on refilling the tanks by just dumping chemicals in them. They would also put salt in the water instead of bringing natural seawater, which even worsened his skin condition. But that didn't stop the Reno Aventura owners from forcing Keiko to perform up to five times a day. He was basically just a money printer for them and a marketing stunt. He was exhausted and in poor health, but his mind was so broken that he never tried to be aggressive. Keiko was a gentle soul, and these conditions slowly exhausted him both physically and mentally. Captive killer whales tend to be aggressive and either rebel or simply fight with each other. But Keiko was silent and never rewarded for his outstanding behavior. He obeyed commands, acted cooperatively, and got along with his dolphin friends, and even started to learn how to communicate with them. His caretaker's baby once fell into Keiko's tank, and this is when he showed his amazing personality. Most of the orcas would play with the child aggressively or simply chomp on it, but Keiko helped the baby up and put him on the surface even before anyone noticed the baby was missing. This incident made worldwide news and Keiko's life was forever changed in 1993 when he became the star of the film Free Willy. This movie captured the hearts of many and highlighted the bond between a young boy named Jesse and the orca known as Willy. Jesse is trying to save Willy from an amusement park that just wants to dump him. The incident with the baby in Reno Aventura also became a scene in the movie. The movie was an international hit and smashed the box office. The success drew attention to Keiko's real situation and raised questions about the ethics of keeping an orca in captivity. And the public put a lot of pressure, with over 300,000 people demanding the immediate release of Keiko. 100,000 phone calls. People called from all over the world, wanting to get involved with efforts to save the world's whales. His living conditions and health problems were highlighted because of the movie. 
He was far from the joyful orca from the movie. Keiko was severely overweight. His skin lesions had gotten way worse and spread all over his body. He had developed even more skin warts and stomach ulcers. The damage to his immune system caused him to become severely underweight, slow and unable to perform. The projected cause for his freedom was insanely high, and the park got only $75,000 for his role in the movie and refused to use the money for Keiko. This all led to a collaborative effort between Warner Brothers and the International Marine Mammal Project. In February 1995, the Free Willy Keiko Foundation was established. Donations from the foundation, two generous benefactors, Greg and Wendy McCall, along with contributions from millions of school children, raised over $7 million. The McCalls themselves donated $2 million. This funding was crucial for Keiko's rehabilitation and potential return to the wild. On January 8, 1996, Keiko's life took a major step towards freedom. He was flown from Mexico to the Oregon Coast Aquarium in Newport, Oregon. There he was placed in a new concrete enclosure containing seawater. This was the first time Keiko was living in bearable conditions. He stayed there to recuperate for eight months and his weight increased significantly during this time, reaching 9,620 pounds by June of 1997. The plan to return Keiko to the wild sparked both hope and controversy. Some believe that the years in captivity made the idea of releasing him unrealistic and that he would never adapt to the wild. However, preparations to reintroduce him began on September 9, 1998. Keiko was flown to Kleetsvik, a bay on the island of Heime in Iceland, in a specialized container filled with salt water and cooled with ice cubes. Under the care of the Free Willy Keiko Foundation and with assistance from the Ocean Future Society, Keiko began the training to prepare for his life in the open ocean. He had to become way stronger as he never swam long distances and supervised swims in the open ocean were a part of his preparation. He had a whole facility dedicated to his training and released into the open waters. After 17 years of slavery, the killer whale was finally close to its homeland. The moment everyone had been waiting for finally arrived in the summer of 2002. Keiko was released into the open ocean off the coast of Iceland. It was a historic event as he became the first captain orca to be returned to the wild. He initially began swimming freely in the Icelandic waters and was spotted in the bay for days. However, Keiko's transition to a complete wildlife was not without its challenges. He continued to receive support from his caretakers, including food supplements, as he adjusted the hunting for his own meals. He also had a satellite transmitter attached to monitor his progress and location. In the following years, he was closely monitored and led on walks where he would interact with other orcas and slowly but surely, he began to become a part of the pod and swim with other orcas for longer periods of time. But Keiko still stayed close to the bay and its people. Sadly, Keiko was alone and looked for company with the people because he kept the love towards them. This is why he would often approach both children and adults and allow them to pet him. Although he occasionally approached groups of wild orcas, he remained on the periphery and did not integrate with them. Because he often sought out the company of humans instead of his own kind, people start raising concerns about his ability to adapt to life in the wild. As Keiko kept refusing to leave the bay and kept interacting with people, the authorities banned all interactions with him except for his caretakers. On December 12, 2003, Keiko was swimming in Taknes Bay in Norway, where he succumbed to pneumonia at the age of 27 and died alone. His passing marked the conclusion of a complex journey that aimed to give him a second chance at life in the wild, but it was too late, as all 17 years in captivity, he was no longer a wild animal. The project to free Keiko was met with mixed results and opinions. While some considered it a success, others believed it fell short of its goals. Keiko's hard time to fully adapt to life in the wild raised questions about the challenges of reintroducing captive animals to their natural habitats. Some think that a better alternative to freeing animals that were held captive for a long time is making some sort of sanctuary where their quality of life would improve, but that these animals could never adapt to living in the wild. Was Keiko's story an entirely successful one? We have our thoughts reserved, but maybe another orca's tale could yield an answer. Freedom for a killer well in captivity is among the sweetest gifts in the world. That's what Lolita sensed when she retired from performing at the Sequarium in Miami. 
The world's oldest captive orca lived for 57 years in a small tank at Sea Aquarium, but now the world wanted her freed. For some years now, Lolita has been miserable. She lost her mate, her beloved Hugo, and with him no more, Lolita was hanging on the edge. She had no children and could no longer come to term. But suddenly, in 2022, it was decided that Lolita had earned her freedom. She was to be transferred to a massive whale sanctuary. But that day would never come, and Lolita would never see the open ocean again. In August of 2023, the alien orca passed away. This is the story of Lolita, a dark tale of an elderly orca who lived to be among the loneliest in captivity. It all goes back to 1967, to the beautiful waters of Puget Sound, where Lolita and her mother lived as resident whales. Puget Sound might look like an ocean paradise, but it was also the happy hunting grounds of the orca boogeyman, Ted Griffin. Griffin was a notorious poacher skilled in capturing and selling juvenile orcas to aquariums in Europe and the US. Lolita was only six years old when Griffin and his team captured her, along with several other juvenile whales after Griffin herded them into Penn Cove, Winby Island. Whale captures are bloody affairs, often ending in the death of orcas, especially the mothers fighting to protect their babies. Lolita's capture was no better. Using speed boats and bombs like M80, Griffin's team surrounded the whales with nets. It was a violent capture with some orcas fighting to resist. Eventually, four juveniles and one adult were killed in the melee. 80 orcas were captured that day in an operation called Namu Incorporated, Lolita was one of them. The gruesome incident stirred many animal activists, especially when three of the carcasses washed up on the shore of Winby Island on November 18, 1970. A legal suit against SeaWorld six years later ended in a settlement, and the company agreed to never again capture orcas in Washington state to avoid publicly taking the blame. Lolita wasn't her original name at the time. She was first named Toki, and she was quite large for her size. For Griffin, that meant loads of cash. At 14 feet long, Lolita was perfect for the regular sized tanks in a marine park. On September 24, 1970, Lolita was sold to Sequarium veterinarian Jesse White for a whopping $20,000 and was sent to Sequarium Miami, where she met Hugo for the first time. Hugo was a giant boarding orca bull who wasn't doing well, though Sequarium thought a mate would do him some good. Lolita's story is intertwined with Hugo's because both got on well together, a reprieve and distraction from their living hell. Hugo's story was no less tragic than Lolita's. Captured in 1968 in equally violent circumstances, Hugo was packed off to the aquarium where he lived in a pen a little bigger than himself. When Lolita arrived, she was half the size of Hugo who measured 22 feet long and weighed 12,000 pounds. Hugo detested his captivity and often rebelled against trainers and refused food, frequently showed aggression, and often tried to harm himself by bashing his head against the wall of the tank. In 1980, Hugo succumbed to self-inflicted torture and created headlines as an orca who took his own life. If at all Hugo lived in brief happiness, it was because of the bond he shared with Lolita. When two orcas from different pods meet, they may not always become friends. There was a risk that Lolita might get aggressive against Hugo, so she was housed in a separate tank adjacent to him. Sequarium felt it was better for the two to get acquainted at first, and they weren't exactly pinning their hopes on the two bonding. Lolita lived in the Whale Bowl, a tank that measured 80 feet by 35 feet and 20 feet deep. But now it would suffice for Lolita, but once she grew to her full length, the Whale Bowl would turn into more of a sardine can for her. It was a huge surprise when Lolita and Hugo began bonding within a few days. Soon, trainers began hearing wails and sounds, a sign that the two orcas were communicating. Both Lolita and Hugo began calling out to each other every night, perhaps from a perspective of solidarity. Somehow, the orcas might have just realized how they were in the same predicament and were consoling each other. One reminded the other of their family and friends free in the ocean. For the next 10 years, Hugo and Lolita became the best of friends. In fact, Lolita might have just been the solace that a depressive Hugo needed. The duo trained together and even performed together, but to say they were happy would not be entirely accurate. After all, both were in a prison. They were far away from the sights and sounds of the ocean, and if you think they enjoyed their performances, 
we have another thing coming. You see, performing orcas have no option but to obey the cues and commands of a trainer during a performance. They've been trained to do so, and not always is the training ideal for a monstrous sized animal like a killer whale. Hugo had lived in Sequoia much before Lolita, so he turned out to be a depressive, suicidal animal. When Lolita arrived, the first few weeks may not have been so bad, with Hugo by her side, she might have thought, okay, let's get used to it. I have a friend. It would be all right. Until, of course, training began. Training a large killer whale goes one of two ways. Obey and get rewarded, or disobey and get punished. An uncooperative killer whale was often prodded and deprived of food, Punishment sometimes extend to depriving an entire team of orcas for the fault of one. This bizarre method would result in the battering and bullying of the guilty orca. But it was a guilty form of coercion that marine parks used all the time. While Hugo remained rebellious, Lolita proved more cooperative. Perhaps it was the presence of Hugo that helped Lolita forget about her depression. In fact, she might have even looked forward to performing with Hugo. The thought of jumping out of the water, swimming at high speeds, and performing tricks might have given a brief reprieve to her captivity. It might have even forget that she was in a tank, but instead, in the ocean with her mate by her side. Lolita was considered a courageous and gentle animal. She even showered affection on some of her trainers and throughout her existence, did not even once attack a human. The same cannot be said for other famous killer whales in captivity. Hugo, Tilikum, and Katsaka are names that will go down in history as examples of why such magnificent beasts belong in the ocean. In his lifetime, Tilikum killed three people, and Katsaka had attacked many. No, it was never their fault. The same could not be said for Lolita. She was the sweetest and often showed affection to humans. On March 3, 1980, Lolita's Hugo was no more. The orca's constant self-battering finally took its toll, and he finally succumbed to a major brain aneurysm. Experts attributed his behavior to suicidal psychosis, often seen in captive whales. The death of Hugo made several animal rights groups, including PETA, sit up and take notice. Hugo's demise gave birth to the rise of Friends of Lolita. The movement was born and kept up its momentum for three decades. Lolita just had to be freed. With her precious Hugo gone, Lolita sank into a depression. Her trainers noticed a marked change in her behavior. She ate less and no longer showed the same enthusiasm. After Hugo's death, Lolita shared her tank with a short-beaked common dolphin and a pilot whale. However, there were no consultation for Lolita, who missed Hugo terribly. Lolita kept on performing for Sequarium until 2021, when new hope dawned for her eventual release. Sequarium was purchased by the Dolphin Company, and simultaneously an order was passed by the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA, prohibiting Lolita and her dolphin companions from public displays and stage shows. Lolita was retired. It seemed the future was bright for Lolita and her release was imminent. The dolphin company would even issue a written undertaking to the Friends of Toki. Lolita would relocate to an ocean sanctuary in her native waters of the Pacific Northwest where she would receive human care. Lolita had lived too many years in captivity, and experts warned that should she ever be released into the open ocean, it would be detrimental to her survival. She had grown too dependent on humans, and ironically, her sweet and gentle nature would work against her total release. Lolita was the oldest living orca in captivity, and her longevity was attributed to her cooperative and friendly nature. Lolita's freedom was not to be an immediate one. An agreement was drawn up between the Dolphin Company and Friends of Toki in March of 2023 planning Lolita's eventual release in early 2024. Till then, she would remain a retired orca in the Sequarium, but that turned out to be a big mistake. In August 2023, Lolita developed a renal condition and began showing signs of serious discomfort. She stopped responding to medication, stopped eating, and looked grievous. On August 18, 2023, the Dolphin Company revealed Lolita passed away. No further details were divulged about her death, the Dolphin Company closed the Sequarium for a day to mourn her loss. For the friends of Toki, and for those who fought for years for Lolita's release, the news of her death was devastating. Peter called it unforgivable. In a thread on X, the organization wrote, Her story will forever remind us of the urgent need to protect our oceans and the magnificent creatures that call them home. 
while destiny prevented Lolita from experiencing the waters of her home again. Her death did not go in vain. It paved the way for bringing attention to the ethical concerns about captivity. Shouldn't Lolita's release have been sooner? Perhaps it was. The beautiful and gentle Orca might have passed away in an environment she could have called home. But let's take a look at her friend in the tank. When Shamu first debuted in SeaWorld, it was a show unlike anything that people had ever seen. A killer whale performing tricks, riding with trainers on its back, it was marvelous. The marine park had turned out to be a paradise of entertainment until one tragic day in 1971, when the ugly face of captivity revealed itself and Shamu attacked. Crowds watched in horror as the nine-year-old orca threw a young Anna Eckes off her back then gnashed down on her leg for the kill. The star of the show had suddenly gone berserk, leaving everyone with a first-hand glimpse of a killer whale in relentless frustration. Anna was rescued just in time. Behind the paradise of entertainment lies a sordid tale of a beautiful beast of nature, and its life cut short only to please humans. This is an endearing story of the life of Shamu, the first performing orca of SeaWorld. For decades, the SeaWorld franchise has wild crowds in Texas, Florida, and California, with their star attraction being the Orca shows. The killer whales were projected as educational and awesome entertainment for families. So successful, in fact, that the name Shamu turned into a brand and a money-making machine. Yet the main character at the center of it all was always an unwilling participant. An Orca who was wrenched cruelly from its home in the ocean to live in a nightmare entertaining humans. It all goes back to a sunny October day in 1965. Ted Griffin was about to set off a mission he enjoyed the most, capturing baby orcas. Griffin had caught a few before and the sight of seeing a juvenile writhe and thrash in a net while its mother lay bleeding was a thrill like no other for him. Shamu would often roam the waters of Penn Cole Puget Sound off Washington, and like every other day she was with her mother. Griffin spied the whales and seized his chance. The killer whale was no match for a seasoned whale hunter, and soon, Shamu found herself in a horrifying situation. These humans were hurling the sharpest weapons at her mother, who kept trying to protect her baby. There was very little that Shamu's mother could do except succumb to her grievous injuries. The large killer whale sank like a stone, leaving her baby at the mercy of a delighted griffin. It was the beginning of a never-ending nightmare for Shamu. It may come as a surprise, but SeaWorld was never intended as a home for Shamu. SeaWorld did not even have performing orcas at the time of her capture. It was all a grand plan for the notorious Ted Griffin to make a mate for Namu, a male orca which he kept at his Seattle Marine Aquarium. Namu was a massive 6.5 meter bull sold to Griffin for $8,000, who showcased the orca as his most prized exhibit in an open pen at Warriors Cove, part of his Seattle Marine Aquarium. Unfortunately, Namu displayed signs of unfathomable stress, often emitting terrifying screams the entire night. Griffin decided that a female mate might just calm him down and that mate turned out to be Shamu. From the vast expanse of the ocean, Shamu found herself suddenly thrust into a small three-sided pen, about 12 by 18 meters and 6 meters deep, kept afloat by empty oil drums. Even worse was how she had a stranger for company. She was not used to being around males because she was still young and always roamed alongside her mother. Shamu missed her mother often, crying and wailing just like Namu. What made things worse was how the pen bordered the open ocean, the appearance of free whales who frequently visited in solidarity with their captured mates only made things worse. Shamu rejected Namu from the start. He was not going to share a small space with a huge male and often fought with him. Griffin's master plan for future breeding was dashed. Realizing his mistake, he sold Shamu to SeaWorld San Diego and a new era in marine entertainment was born. SeaWorld, the brand new attraction at Rock, California, was promoted as a marine lover's paradise. Founded in 1964, it encompassed all 22 acres along the shores of Mission Bay and became a resounding success within a few days of its inauguration. The appearance of Shamu at SeaWorld skyrocketed the popularity of the marine entertainment company. Seeing small sharks, large turtles, and performing dolphins was one thing, but seeing a giant orca up close was a mind-blowing experience for many, except Shamu. 
From Griffin's hellhole to SeaWorld, it was like jumping from the frying pan into the fire for Shamu. Her living space at SeaWorld was no better than the Pennant Warrior's Cove. This was just as small and as claustrophobic. Shamu had now grown to 1,700 feet long, yet the tank she was housed in was just 20 feet by 30 feet. If Shamu stood vertically in the pool, the water would never cover her entire body. It was solitary confinement of the worst kind. From an unwilling mate to a male orca to a performing one at SeaWorld, Shamu's transition was not an easy one. SeaWorld was a completely alien environment. While she loved the water, she loved the feel of being able to swim, row, and jump in a performing tank larger than hers. She was often puzzled why the humans poked, prodded, and forced her to do things she never wanted to. She didn't know how. Training to interact and perform stunts with humans was a nightmare for Shamu. She was scolded if she didn't oblige. She was starved and soon learned to associate cooperation with food. SeaWorld was ecstatic. Shamu became a celebrity. She was featured on billboards, the subject of TV shows, and of course, the crowds. How the groups loved her. And each time she surfaced out of the water with a human standing on the tip of her nose. The group would go berserk and echo and chant, Shamu, Shamu, everyone was happy. SeaWorld was raking in millions, but everything was not right with Shamu. She was falling into depression. SeaWorld was oblivious to the mental and physical harm to the orca. Instead, the standalone marine park soon opened more franchises in Orlando, Florida, Ohio, and San Antonio, Texas. More parks meant a demand for more orcas, and soon, several more juveniles were captured by men like Griffin and sold to SeaWorld. Shamu performed at SeaWorld for six years, but all was not right with the female orca. She was just nine years old, but already showing signs of distress. SeaWorld shrugged off all concerns, attributing Shamu's actions as normal stress. They failed to recognize how Shamu was reaching a breaking point, and desperation would soon turn to an attack. On April 19, 1971, Gail McLaughlin, SeaWorld's public relations director, and Kent Burgess asked SeaWorld's secretary, 22-year-old Anna Eckes, if she wanted to ride Shamu. They thought it would be an incredible publicity stunt, showing off how safe killer whale shows could be. McLaughlin and Burgess were naive and had no idea such actions could go wrong. Captive killer whales may be trained and obedient, but one thing not taken into consideration is their unpredictability. Moreover, such wild creatures view only trainers as masters, and their cooperation and loyalty are only directed at such individuals. Making them interact with a stranger is just asking for trouble, but it was arranged, and unsuspecting and excited Anna happily agreed. Anna was no novice to water, she was a trained scuba diver and an excellent swimmer, but interacting up close with a killer whale is an entirely different ball game. Anna was warned before the stunt that it was a risk, things could go wrong and she could fall off, but none her wildest dreams that she envisioned an attack. Anna changed into a diving suit and got into the water with Shamu. Everything appeared normal. Anna followed all her cues and Shamu seemed to cooperate. Soon, Anna got onto the orca's back and raised her hand, smiled and waved to the crowd. As Shamu began swimming towards the deep end of the pool, disaster struck. One swift stroke, Shamu tossed Anna off, launching her into the water. Driven by instinct, years of depression and trauma, Shamu unleashed her rage on Anna. With her enormous teeth, Shamu grabbed the girl's leg and clamped down. Anna was trapped and Shamu refused to let go. Anna screamed. She was in shock and could not believe what was happening. Why would Shamu attack her? If Shamu was not close to the pool's edge, it might have been a terrifying tragedy for SeaWorld. Nonetheless, all the excitement and joy soon turned into horror as the crowd watched the star orca drag Anna Echis around in her mouth. Fortunately, other trainers sprung into action in attempts to distract the killer whale. By now, the water was turning red with the blood from Anna's ankle. Shamu's teeth were embedded in her flesh and clamped shut like a vice. Soon, one of the trainers had the idea of driving the pool into the orca's mouth, forcibly prying her jaw open. The tactic worked, allowing Anna to break free. Anna was then taken to safety as Shamu swam around in circles in her pool, oblivious to what she had done. The crowd was all shocked and silent, and the terror turned into some iconic reprieve for Shamu. Her performing days were over. 
I was so afraid I was going to drown. And because she would dive and go down, and I didn't know how long she would, you know, be down there. As for Anna Eckes, the girl suffered a horrible deep gash that required 100 stitches. In the same year, Anna sued SeaWorld for fraud, negligence, and liability for an animal with vicious or dangerous propensities. She was awarded $17,500 in damages, and SeaWorld's appeals for a non suit and a new trial were denied. Even though Shamu was retired from performing, her life was worse than ever. The stimulation of performing was denied. She was made to live in her puny little tank, and the trauma took its toll. By the end of 1971, Shamu contracted a severe uterine infection, which did not respond to treatment. Too fragile and ill, she died of septicemia, and was just nine years old. In contrast, a free orca in the ocean can live to almost 90 years old, the average being 80. Shamu's death did not mark the end of SeaWorld shows. The marine park has tasted billions and will never pass that up. A new orca, Helena, the first to be born and survive in captivity, adored the mantle of Shamu and the show continued. Was it right of SeaWorld to establish a live performing band that involved the suffering and captivity of a beautiful animal? We have our thoughts reserved, but maybe another orca's tale could give the answer. An aquatic celebrity who attracted thousands of admirers from all over the U.S. suddenly ends his own life, leaving everyone in shock. The death of Hugo, the killer orca, is one of many incidents that highlights the psychological torture mammals face in captivity and how their suffering is glorified in the aquarium industry. But who was Hugo, the killer orca, and what were the reasons that led to him ending his own life? It was the year 1965 when Hugo, a majestic southern resident killer whale, took his very first breath in the vast and mysterious ocean. Just like his family, Hugo spent his days gracefully traversing the waters, skillfully hunting for food alongside his devoted family. But little did he know, his life was about to take a devastating turn. Fast forward to 1968, Hugo's world was shattered. In Vaughan Bay, Washington, his days of freedom came to a heart-wrenching end. He was captured, torn away from everything he had ever known. Imagine being only three years old and being forcibly separated from your loved ones, transported over 3,000 miles away to a place unknown. That was Hugo's tragic reality. This aquarium in Florida became his new home, a concrete prison they called the Celebrity Bowl. In this confined space, Hugo's magnificent body was trapped, only a fraction of his immense size able to be submerged in the water. Isolated from the outside world, he became nothing more than a spectacle, a mere source of profit for the aquarium. However, amidst the bleakness, there was one man who refused to accept this mistreatment. Richard O'Berry, a former trainer of Hugo, witnessed the pitiful scene firsthand. In his book, Behind the Dolphin's Smile, O'Berry vividly describes the hearty. When I fed Hugo, his tail would be lying on the bottom and his head would be completely out of the water. It was pathetic. They wanted me to train him. I refused and left in disgust. Yet, in the midst of Hugo's despair, fate had another twist in store. A glimmer of hope emerged in the form of a new companion named Lolita. Like Hugo, she too had suffered a tragic fate, losing all of her family members to ruthless hunters. And so her path led her to this aquarium, where she found herself sharing the same stage as Hugo. But their initial introduction wasn't immediate. Kept in separate tanks to prevent any potential conflicts, the two orcas called out to each other during the lonely nights, yearning for connection. Their sorrowful cries echoed throughout the walls, an undeniable testament to their longing for companionship. Recognizing the undeniable bond between these two remarkable creatures, the aquarium's managers made a bold decision. They reunited Hugo and Lolita in a new tank, hoping for a positive outcome, and to everyone's amazement, the two orcas thrived together. It was a fresh start for Hugo, a chance to rediscover happiness and find solace in the companionship that he so desperately craved. Hugo and Lolita quickly became the stars of this aquarium. Their awe-inspiring performances captivated the hearts of thousands who flocked from far and wide to witness their magnificent displays. Television ads showcased their incredible bond, enticing people to experience their beauty firsthand. Yet, Behind the gleeful images projected in those advertisements, a heartbreaking reality looked beneath the surface. 
The whales, despite the smiles they wore for the audience, were suffering. Their lives offstage were consumed by misery, hidden behind a facade of entertainment. As time went on, more and more spectators came to witness the amazing orcas and their performances. But things weren't looking so good for Hugo as the longer he stayed in captivity, the quicker his sanity degraded. Hugo began developing a habit of ramming his head against the tank walls, what seemed like a quirky habit for outsiders, but was actually an indication of Hugo's patience running out. As days went by, Hugo started to lose control over his impulses and began to act violently towards the trainers of this aquarium. In 1970, during a rehearsal, a trainer stuck his head inside Hugo's mouth, which was already a bad idea. But to his surprise, Hugo bit down and lethally injured him, which resulted in the trainer getting 10 stitches in his head and neck. Just like his behavior, Hugo's aggressive habits became volatile as well. In 1971, an incident occurred where Hugo broke a hole in the plastic window of his orca tank and severed the tip of his nose. It was concluded that the incident occurred due to Hugo's habit of ramming his head against the tank walls. Hugo was taken to a vet and his skin piece was reattached, but within a week it came off. As a result, Hugo bore a permanent small depression on the tip of his nose that he would have for the remainder of his lifetime. As years went by, Hugo's self-destructive behaviors kept on growing. As in 1972, a sequarium trainer, Max Jacks, reported that Hugo had caused harm to many people by forcefully bumping into them with his head whenever he became irritated. Several other trainers also attested to Hugo's tendency to behave aggressively and initiate attacks against the aquarium staff members. One unfortunate individual even sustained a permanent scar on their arm as a result of an encounter with the whale. It seemed like Lolita's presence could not prevent Hugo from losing his sanity and harming others. Even though Hugo showed clear signs of hostility towards the staff of this aquarium, they were not going to let him go that easily, as he and Lolita were the stars of the show that brought in thousands of dollars weekly, making management wealthy beyond their wildest dreams, but their greed sacrificed the health of their animals as Hugo's sanity was lost with time. The animals that were once meant to explore the open seas were now being held captive for their entire lives inside a concrete pool for others' entertainment. It was a fate worse than death, and soon it would lead to the demise of poor young Hugo. Soon, tragedy was going to strike faster than anyone could have imagined, as Hugo's self-destructive behavior was soon going to decide his fate. At the beginning of 1980, Hugo was acting sluggishly and began facing fatigue, but no medical examination took place as an animal's health was not a priority back then. Even in his suffering, he was not being noticed by the staff. According to them, Hugo was looking fine and healthy. They carried on with his usual training routines, but this carelessness from the staff would eventually result in lethal consequences. Soon, the adored star of aquarium was going to make headlines for all the wrong reasons as years of self-destructive behavior finally caught up to young Hugo, eventually leading him towards his death. On March 4, 1980, Hugo and Lolita were rehearsing their stunts for an opening event on the same day, but it seemed like the curtain for Hugo was closing even before he could become part of the spotlight. Hugo stopped moving completely and floated above the water like a wooden plank for quite some time. The trainers called out to Hugo multiple times to move and even threw bait towards his way to get a reaction. They thought Hugo must have gone under a half-brain sleep, but even after multiple tries, they could get no response from him. Upon closer inspection, they realized that the young orca had passed away. Many that came to make joyful memories were welcomed with sadness, as hundreds of spectators saw the lifeless body of the beloved star being hoisted out of his tank. Hugo's death left everyone in shock, but unlike everyone else, the Sequoia resumed the show as if nothing had happened. During an autopsy, it was revealed that Hugo died due to brain aneurysm. For some, it was proof that Hugo's death was due to his habit of thrashing against the tank walls. Following his passing, Hugo's body was discreetly disposed of at an undisclosed location. Many claimed that the management of the Sequarium dumped Hugo's body in the local landfill, but these were mere speculations made by people enraged at the management's mistreatment of the animal. After Hugo's death, Everything went back to normal, and the show carried on without him. Lolita would later do all the performances by herself, entertaining crowds of hundreds that had no idea what the orc was actually feeling deep down inside. For Lolita, 
Hugo was the only friend she had since her captivity. With him gone, she was once again alone, swimming in circles in a concrete pool with no freedom in sight. Hugo wasn't the only whale to show hostility towards his captors. Throughout the 1960s and 1990s, there have been many incidents of captive killer whales attacking aquarium staff members from all over the globe, and even killing some in the process. For instance, killer whales like Lupa, Tilikum, and Cuddles all showed a familiar pattern of aggression and rebellion against people while being in captivity. As the trend towards aquarium kept on increasing over the years, so did reports of captive orcas attacking, creating a debate among activists about whether or not these behaviors are a result of orcas fighting for their freedom. Rebellious orcas aren't the only issue here, as there have been many reports of young orcas dying due to multiple reasons, but the majority of the cases point towards the lack of facilities that the aquariums had. Many activists have highlighted the fact that aquariums collect aquatic life in large quantities without even assessing their capabilities first. During a USDA audit conducted in 2017, it was discovered that the tank housing Lolita failed to meet the size criteria mandated by federal law, which validated the activists' criticism. By looking into the history of Hugo and Lolita, we wonder, will this aquarium ever be held accountable for the mistreatment of animals such as Hugo? Will animals like Lolita ever get the freedom they deserve? We may never know. But remember that there were other orcas that also suffered the same way that Hugo did. On February 24, 2010, tourists at SeaWorld in Orlando were excited, thinking they were about to watch an entertaining relationship session between Tilikum, a killer whale, and trainer Don Branchow. Just as Branchow leaned over the edge of his tank, the 11-ton orca reached up and chomped down on her head instead. What transpired next was a macabre scene of mayhem and carnage, as Tilikum dragged Branchow into the pool, shook her like a rag doll, crushed her bones, and drowned her till she went limp and died. Even as the staff tried netting him, Tilikum savaged her and would not let go of her body. But why? What made the well-trained Tilikum, often described as gentle, go crazy? Dawn Branchow wasn't the only human to suffer the unpredictability of Tilikum. Ever since the massive orca was captured as a two-year-old calf in 1983, his life turned out tragically wrong. Brancho was his third victim, and while it may seem puzzling to the people who trained and performed with him, others felt differently. Animal behavior experts felt it was his bizarre existence that led him to display extreme behavior. Tilikum was a killer whale. He was born in the wild and meant to live in the ocean with his mother, not in an enclosure as an object for human amusement. As Hellman Melvy, author of Moby Dick, once wrote, There is no folly of the beasts of the earth which is not infinitely outdone by the madness of men. He knew exactly what he was saying. Tilikum was always a rebel. He never took the training kindly, often creating trouble for his fellow orcas. It seemed he was never really tamed, and though the marine entertainment industry tried to pass off the Brancho incident as an accident, and a playful incident gone wrong, several members of the audience felt the killer whale knew exactly what he was doing and that is enough to creep anyone out. Tilikum was just a young orca when he was captured off the coast of eastern Iceland in 1983. Until the age of three, he was kept at a marine zoo in Iceland. A year later, he was transported to a small aquatic park near Sealand of the Pacific in Victoria, British Columbia, where he performed for eight years. He was transferred to SeaWorld in Orlando, Florida in 1992. Besides being one of the most notorious orcas, perhaps in the history of marine world entertainment, Tilikum also sired 21 calves at SeaWorld. Former trainers at Sealand always remembered Tilikum as an orca with a friendly nature, but others begged to differ. There were reports from Sealand that described how Tilikum, from day one, did not fit into the life of a performing orca. He rebelled against training. Watching those orcas perform for you at any marine world might be incredible, but for human entertainment, an orca might just even have had to go without food if he didn't get his routine right in training. As is the custom, new orcas were usually paired with trained killer whales. Unfortunately, if the whale in training does not follow the cues of the trained whales, both animals would be deprived of food and that's exactly what Tilikum would do. But then, that's when life began getting difficult for him. Other whales, frustrated his behavior, began thrashing him. Tilikum would often be found bloodied but he would also be found with a bleeding tooth. It was the beginning of hell, and it was probably what installed within Tilikum a type of stress and rage 
just waiting to burst out. Things went from bad to worse for Tilikum. Sealand was a living nightmare for the 16-foot orca. Of course, by the time he was fully adult size, he would end up weighing a whopping 12,000 pounds and measuring 22 feet long. But even for a 16-foot orca, living in an enclosure of 20 by 30 feet is almost akin to solitary confinement. Sealand was like a small marina surrounded by nets. The owners were always afraid some animal activists would try to free the whales. To prevent this, three orcas, including Tilikum, were confined to a single steel container, and that's when Tilikum would get thrashed every night. And the lights were all turned out, so there's really no stimulation. They're just in this dark metal 20-foot by 30-foot pool. It didn't feel good, and it, it was just wrong. It's obvious how stressful that was for the whales, considering the fact that these large sea creatures travel almost 100 miles daily at sea. And here were three of them, not even allowed a fraction of that distance to move around. It's unfortunate that the violence being meted out to Tilikum was hardly being paid attention to. Clearly, the whales were in distress, and distressed animals are often offensive, aggressive, and dangerous. The first sign of Tilikum's rage became evident in 1991, when at Sealand, a young, inexperienced female trainer, Kelty Byrne, fell into the pool that housed Tilikum and his two hostile companions. The trainer was instantly attacked by the whales, who dragged her around the pool. The terrified Byrne managed to swim for her life to reach the other end of the pool, but the whales were hot on her heels and dragged her back down. Other trainers tried their best distracting the whales. They even threw the girl a life ring, but the whales made sure she didn't get to it. Even though she surfaced twice, she eventually drowned. No one dared to try to recover her body, lest they suffered a similar fate. Her remains were only fished out of water several hours later. Several theories abounded in attempts to explain the incident. Trainers never usually entered the pools of orcas, so it was assumed that the killer whales were caught by surprise and might have just been playing, keeping the girl underwater longer than she could hold her breath. No one will ever really know what could have been on their minds. The incident led to Sealand closing within a year, and that was when Tilikum was sold to SeaWorld Orlando. Besides performing, SeaWorld would go on to use Tilikum as a breeder. To them, the killer whale was a sperm producer worth millions. Even in SeaWorld, Tilikum was bullied and beaten by female Pacific Northwest whales. Putting an Icelandic orca with whales from different geo locations was just asking for trouble. From an orca's perspective, Tilikum was from another planet, and how the poor guy suffered for it. Tilikum struck again in 1999 when a 27-year-old man, Daniel Dukes, was found lying dead on Tilikum's back in his nighttime pool. SeaWorld stuck to its original story that Dukes was a vagrant who had climbed into Tilikum's pool and drowned. But animal rights activists and even the coroner's report revealed the sinister details of what really could have happened. Dukes' body was found with several wounds, abrasions, and badly mutilated. Even his genitals were bitten off by the whale. It was never established what actually happened since there was no CCTV cameras present. Media reports played down the event, reporting that Dukes was a nuisance and a trespasser, but a documentary titled Blackfish challenged the theory that Dukes was a direct victim of Tilikum. The reality about how deadly Tilikum could be was finally revealed to the entire world during the incident when SeaWorld star trainer Darren Brancho was mauled by the star of their show, Tilikum. This time, there was no cover-ups, no fancy stories or denials by authorities. The truth of the dangers of keeping orcas was laid bare, like some macabre showstopper on the ill-fated day of February 24, 2010. 40-year-old Dawn Brancho was a regular performer with Tilikum. After she had completed a show with him, she fondly rubbed his nose as part of the post-show routine. Without warning, the orca grabbed her ponytail and pulled her into his tank. Witnesses are reported that the whale pulled her by the arm, while others said the whale pulled her by the shoulder. What transpired next was like some reality horror show for the audience witnessing a live mutilation of a human by one of the world's most dangerous predators. Tilikum scout Brancho and then chewed off her arm and ate it. Several trainers jumped into action by throwing food and nets over the killer orca, but Tilikum was having his day in the limelight. He wasn't about to stop. He finally got the world to believe he was dangerous and not supposed to be where he was. Tilikum shook Brancho's body like a toy. The 12,000-pound orca wasn't going to let go. Even when trainers managed to direct him to a medical pool, he dragged Brancho's body along with him. Brancho was already dead by then. 
SeaWorld never really recovered from the deadly incident. Dwindling audiences, pressure from both human rights groups as well as animal activists finally led to the stopping of the orca breeding program. Thereafter, trainers were not allowed in the pool anymore. As for Tillicum, in 2016, his health began failing him, and he soon contracted bacterial pneumonia. He passed away on January 6, 2017. The mutilation of Dawn Brancho and how she was killed by one of the world's most famous orcas was the highlight of the documentary Blackfish and the book Death at SeaWorld. Experts, attempting to analyze the reason for the attack, felt the orca thought he had done the right thing, yet he was not rewarded as was the custom. His frustration might have acted as a trigger to attack Dawn. Let me tell you something, folks. What a killer whale thinks is a tantrum is savagery for humans. Perhaps since Tilikum sees the world from the perspective of an orca, one cannot expect an orca to realize that humans are fragile midgets compared to their might and strength. Perhaps Tilikum's intention was never to kill, but we will never know. Who should be blamed for the death of Don Brancho or Tilikum's other victims? Organizations like SeaWorld like to think the whales are part of their family, but that is not so. A whale's family is right there in the ocean from whom they have been snatched away from. While that remains one opinion, what do you feel about places like SeaWorld keeping such monstrous killer whales captive for entertainment? <laughs>